Good afternoon, I'm Anthony Log with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. More calls are being made for the government to provide additional stimulus packages to assist struggling businesses, the unemployed and the poor. This as COVID-19 continues to cause significant pressure on some businesses closing, forcing closure. It was a point raised by opposition spokesman on finance Julian Robinson last evening at a Kiwanis meeting. Herman Green reports. There's a call for help for members of the society facing hardship since the onset of the COVID pandemic in Jamaica last year March. For one, the tourism sector continues to bear the brunt of the fallout and is facing further challenges with new restrictions set to come into play on Tuesday, with the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom requiring those landing in their countries to have a negative COVID test result. Addressing a meeting of the Kiwanis Club of North St. Andrew yesterday, opposition spokesman on finance, Julian Robinson, joined the call for another stimulus package. We need a stimulus that will jumpstart our economy, incentivize production, boost job creation, and unleash spending so that we can break through poverty and the strangling stagnation and get on a path of real and meaningful recovery. On Wednesday, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark declined to say whether the government is considering another COVID-19 stimulus package. He said the initial response was due to the loss of jobs caused by the pandemic. We will continue to assess and you know, make decisions that are, con that are consistent with uh, those assessments. At Thursday's sitting of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, Financial Secretary Darlene Morrison noted that there is no allocation in the third supplementary estimates to finance another stimulus package. The finance minister responded today on the morning agenda on Power 106. When we came out with the care program, we didn't come out with that care program having been urged by anybody or having been asked by anybody to do so. We saw what was happening and we responded, uh, you know, proactively. Uh, the budget will be tabled in a very short time and it would be inappropriate at this point to speak too definitively about it because we're still in the process of uh, putting everything together. So I don't want to, you know, what is happening there, there's a bit of politics jumping the gun, uh, you know, in terms of the budget debate and so on. And I don't want to, to follow suit. But Mr. Robinson says it would not be hard for the government to provide the stimulus package. To fund the stimulus, the government can either go back to or international financial institutions, or they could reduce what is termed the primary surplus. The primary surplus is the difference between what the government spends, what it collects in taxes, minus what we have to use for debt repayment. We currently have a primary surplus of 3.1%. And just as an example, if we reduce the primary surplus by approximately 1%, that can release about $20 billion for a stimulus package, which I believe is needed. Herman Green, TVJ News. Meanwhile, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says the government is looking to resume its program of privatizing state assets. Among the pending engagements are the privatization of the state's interest in the Jamaica Public Service Company, JPS, the Jamaica Mortgage Bank, JMB, and the Soapberry Treatment Plant, which spans St. Andrew and St. Catherine. There are a number of other initiatives, such as the uh, Soapberry Waste Management Plant. There are a number of infrastructure opportunities that are going to come down the pipeline. But those, uh, the timeline has just been shifted, just uh, out of 2020 and hopefully into 2021, uh, or maybe shortly thereafter. But privatizations are a key part of the government's uh, policy platform going forward. A total of $1.8 billion has been allocated for the procurement of laptops and tablets for students. Minister of Finance Dr. Nigel Clark says the funds come from a reallocation of monies from the Education Ministry to the Science and Technology Ministry, which will be purchasing the devices for the students. The Ministry of Education has engaged the Ministry of Science and Technology as its agent. And the Ministry of Science and Technology will be purchasing the laptops on its behalf. The expenditure will come from the Ministry of Education. 
Justice Minister Delroy Chuck says his ministry will discuss the request from members of the public for prison sentences to be slapped on offenders who leak data from the National Identification System. The suggested punishment for breaches at this time is for a $3 million fine. However, scores of Jamaicans have been demanding prison time for persons found in breach. Some persons say a fine will easily be paid for someone rich or powerful. The matter was raised in a virtual town hall meeting. It's a suggestion being put by a member of the public and we must give it due consideration whether in lieu of a fine, not only a term of imprisonment, but an option should be given to the judge where the information or perhaps such large amount of information has been leaked of individual or individuals whether a judge should not have the option to impose a prison sentence. So it is something that we will consider. Meanwhile, Jamaicans are again advised to get on board with the national identification system needs. The latest call came from Senator Aubin Hill. Mr. Hill is on the committee set up to discuss the NIDS bill. He says while NIDS will not be mandatory by law, people who will not be able to do business with, the com with companies if they don't have a NIDS card. So in time, in practice, if not in law, the NIDS will become the premier identification that most anybody will tend to ask you for, which is why you should try and get your NIDS card as quickly as possible. So you stop carrying passport around, TR and all that. You have that. You have NIDS. Everybody will be able to identify you. So in practice, it will probably, those other uh, pieces of identification will fall away. And it's now time for a break, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back. Continuing the news. Three persons are in police custody following the shooting death of a man in Bluntas District in Treasure Beach, St. Elizabeth, yesterday. This latest killing is the third in the parish in over 24 hours. The details in this report. Thursday evening, 38-year-old Adrian Lewis of a Greenfield District address was shot dead in Blunter's St. Elizabeth. It's understood that Mr. Lewis, who was a businessman and a construction worker, operated a bar in Blunter's District where he was fatally shot. About 6.40, Mr. Lewis was inside the bar with customers when a car drove up. Two men alighted from the vehicle, entered the bar, then shot Mr. Lewis. None of the customers was injured. No motive has been established for the killing. Hours later, three people, one female and two males, were taken into police custody in connection with the murder. About 9 o'clock, a motor car suspected to be that which was used by Mr. Lewis's attackers was intercepted by the police in an area known as Gutters. A gun found in their possession was seized. The vehicle was heading towards Mandeville. This latest killing is the third in the parish in 24 hours and five since the start of the year. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. The government earned almost $692 million in revenues for the 2019-2020 financial year from land transactions. The sum was revealed in a land divestment report tabled in Parliament recently. For the period 2019 to 2020, the government earned an estimated $691.6 million from land transactions. During that time, 211 approvals were granted for the divestment of lands. 54 of the parcels were for sale, while 40 properties were to be leased. Most of the lands sold were for residential or agricultural purposes. This segment raked in $410 million. As for leases granted, most were for commercial or industrial use. About $33 million was potentially earned from the transactions. The divestment process also saw the regularization of a few illegal users of government-owned property. Fourteen ministerial approvals were granted during the period for the process to take place. As for other land transactions, seven subleases were approved, 94 transfers, and three permits for use without possession were granted. Sasha Lee Hamilton, TVJ News. 
members of parliament are being raked over the coals for not utilizing money set aside to patch roads which were damaged by rains late last year. MPs were allocated $7 million each to conduct emergency patching over the Christmas period. However, Executive Director of the National Works Agency, E.G. Hunter, indicated that some MPs have been delinquent in getting the work started. 22% um, of the total have utilized the patching um, provision and another 27 of the uh, 27 constituencies have started but not completed and 12 constituencies have not yet started any work under the patching program. Mr. Hunter has called on MPs who are yet to start work to do so quickly to bring relief to the motoring public who are using roads which were damaged by the, by the rains late last year. All work should be done by the end of March. The National Works Agency is reporting that remedial work done on the Howard Cook Boulevard Bridge in St. James is complete. Community Relations Officer at NWA in Montego Bay, Janelle Ricketts, gave an update. The bridge is structurally sound. However, we have a challenge in terms of the missing expansion joints. So since last year, we have made attempts to have the area uh, fixed in a temporary way in terms of having the metal plates affixed over the affected section and we are continuing with this now in terms of reinforcing work that were previously completed. She adds that more work will be done, however she did not give a timeline. We have a greater plan to have a more permanent fix to the situation but in the interim we are securing the expansion joints of the bridge but just to advise motorists that the bridge is structurally sound, it is safe. The Biden administration in the United States has made its intention clear to reverse a Trump decision to withdraw his country from the World Health Organization, WHO. U.S. President Joe Biden communicated his intention in a letter dated January 20, 2021 to Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. On July 6 last year, then-President Donald Trump gave notice that he would withdraw his country from the health organization, saying the WHO needed to be reformed. Mr. Trump had also said the funds which the United States contributes to the WHO would be redirected to other worldwide and deserving, urgent global public health needs. However, Mr. Biden is not only reversing that decision, but he also says his administration will be working with the WHO and the United Nations in combating COVID-19 and future biological catastrophes. In the meantime, he has committed to fulfilling the financial obligations of the United States to the World Health Organization. Back here in Jamaica, COVID-19 has claimed another life in Jamaica. The latest case is a 43-year-old woman from Westmoreland. Her case has increased the death toll to 332. The Ministry of Health says three more deaths are under investigation. Meanwhile, a one-week-old child is among 108 persons who tested positive for COVID-19 in Jamaica yesterday. This has increased the country's case count to 14,658. The number of persons hospitalized with a respiratory illness has reduced to 111. Twelve of them are critically ill. To news in sports now, it was another dismal batting display for the West Indies as they went down by seven wickets to host Bangladesh in the second one-day international in Dhaka. Electing to bat, the West Indies were bowled out for 148 in 43.4 overs. Rav Ravman Powell top scored with 41, while fellow Jamaican Kruma Bonner made 20. Debutant Kajorn Otley also made 24, as Mahidi Hassan took 4 for 25. In reply, Bangladesh posted 149 for 3 in 33.2 overs. Captain Tamim Iqbal top scored with 50, while Shakib Al Hassan ended on 43 not out as the Bangladesh took an unbeaten as the Bangladesh took an unbeatable 2-0 lead in the three-match series. The third ODI takes place in Chattogram on Sunday. 
And that's the Midday News. I'm Anthony Lugg. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon.